Hey friends, welcome to my podcast, Straight Talk with Celine. God's redemption over my life has led to many radical changes in me. One gift God has given me is a hunger for his word and a passion to share it with you. The Bible tells us all we need to know about God, but it also tells us all we need to know about ourselves and we fail to open it and learn these great truths. A burden that weighs heavy on me is that many professing Christians don't know their identity in Christ. So join me now as we walk through God's word and learn who we are in Christ so we can step into all he's called us to be. Today we open our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew to walk through um, one of my favorite parables that our Lord Jesus ever spoke, the parable of the ten virgins. Yes, it's, it's one of my favorite parables, but also one of the most terrifying parables that Jesus ever spoke. And why would this be my favorite? Well, it's, it's one of those parables that just cuts me straight to my heart. Please open with me to the 25th chapter of Matthew as I read verses 1 through 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So Jesus ended his famous Sermon on the Mount with some of the most terrifying words I think he ever said. It's the words he will say to those who would come to him at the end of the age and say, Lord, Lord, have we not done these things in your name? And Jesus will respond to them, depart from me, I never knew you. I mean, if anything Jesus said in his ministry that can compete with those words, the the parable that I just read to you is it. And let me remind you all, these are the words of our Lord Jesus. Right now, our hearts and minds should be awake. What what I'm about to share is important for every single one of us to hear. I'm going to pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word that is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, it is your word that cuts me, that diagnoses me, that completely convicts me, Lord causes me to change, causes me to become more like you. And so, Lord, I pray now for whoever's watching this, whoever's listening to this, um, Lord, that they would receive the same convictions, Lord, that you would um, open their minds to understand your word, Lord, that you would use me as a vessel, and Lord, that you would be glorified through this. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray that, um, Lord, I would focus on you being the audience And Lord, that um, your word that you say goes out, never returns void. Lord, I pray you would use me as a vessel to touch as many people as possible. In Jesus' name, amen. So this parable was given by our Lord to highlight the importance of, of being ready for his second coming. And even if there is a delay and it takes longer than anticipated, we must be ready. There will be no second chances for those who don't take this serious and and are unprepared. I want to point out that this parable speaks more about a person's inward motivation, not outward behavior. In other words, our inward motivation drives our outward behavior. This parable screams heart check. It's important to know that Matthew 25 was written in light of Matthew 24. The two chapters 
they must be read together. There is a broader context that we must see here. We're, we're talking eschatology here. This fifth discourse known as the Olivet Discourse is all about things to come. It was about the fall of Jerusalem. It's, it's about end times. It's about Jesus' second coming. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the end of age and what it will be like when he returns. And notice that Matthew 24 ends with the emphasis being on uh, readiness for Christ's return. Matthew 24 essentially zooms out to see the whole view of end times and Jesus' return, while Matthew 25 zooms in on his actual return and what it will be like when he returns to confront his professing church individually. In Matthew 25, we have the parable of the 10 virgins, which urges us to examine our hearts as we prepare. We are to make sure we have oil while we still have the opportunity. The parable of the talents urges us to examine what we are doing as we prepare. And then we see at the end of chapter 25, the final judgment, which is the test of how we loved others in the church while Jesus was gone. I want us to discover some things today as we break down this text. Who are the wise and foolish virgins? Who? What's the, the torches in the oil? What does it mean to get drowsy and sleep? What is the marriage feast? And lastly, what does it mean to watch and be prepared? When we read this parable, what's actually happening? Jesus is comparing what it will be like when the bridegroom comes to a wedding ceremony of old. These virgins were bridesmaids in the waiting. Most weddings that we are used to in our context take place during the day, but weddings in ancient times, they mostly took place at night. So here's the bride's friends waiting for the approach of the groom, and these brides were to escort him to the bride and to the ceremony in a, a beautiful procession. They, they were to be ready, and, and their main responsibility was to have torches full of oil to light the way. And while they waited, the groom was slow to get there and he didn't come as quickly as they anticipated, so they fell asleep. And while they slept, they woke to the announcement that it was time and he was coming. It was time to, to get up and escort him to the bride. Five of the maids were ready with their torches and their oil. And so they prepared their lamps and they led him to the bride and the ceremony. And the other maids discovered that they weren't ready. And in their embarrassment, they ran to buy oil needed to light their lamps, to light their torches. And while they were gone, the opportunity to attend the wedding and the feast passed them by. And when they returned from, from getting their oil, they were shut out of the big event. So let's go to our text and let's look at the details and let's allow the spirit to deal with our hearts as we discover what's being said here. Verse one through two, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. Who are these virgins? Why were the wise wise and why were the foolish foolish? Well, I have to commit to believe that Jesus is referring to the virgins representing those who outwardly profess him as Lord. The virgins are the professing church, not the world. This parable is for all professing believers as it was when Jesus shared it. So if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, this message is for you. Notice the things that genuine Christians who are wise virgins and fake Christians who are foolish virgins have in common. First, they, they have church membership. They, they all claim to be Christians. Second, they know doctrine. Okay, all who claim Christ widely accept the Bible's teachings. Notice the foolish virgins call Jesus Lord at the end of the parable. 
The Greek word used here for Lord is kurios, which means Lord or Sir. But, but they aren't calling Jesus Sir. The foolish virgins are referring to him as Lord. They're referring to him as Master. They profess him as God in the flesh. And lastly, they have an expectation. Every single one of them have an expectation or an anticipation of Jesus' return. They all had lamps. So calling yourself a Christian, claiming Jesus as Lord, and expecting his return doesn't make you a wise virgin. So what makes the wise virgin wise? Well, we'll look to verses 3 through 4. It says, For when the foolish took their lamps... They took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. Notice both the wise and the foolish virgins had lamps. The only difference in the two was that the wise took extra oil. Here we see the wise and what makes them wise. They have oil. And what does this oil and, and the torches symbolize? Well, I have to commit to believe that this oil represents the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 9 tells us that no one can be a true Christian without the Holy Spirit. If the oil represents the Holy Spirit, could the lamps or, or these torches be the hearts, the actions, the motives that need the oil of the Spirit to remain lit? I mean, we all can agree that the Spirit is what guides and empowers everything in the Christian life. Without the Holy Spirit, you can do nothing. Verse 5, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. So what does it mean to, to, to get drowsy and sleep? It means they slept. This refers to inactivity. This refers to rest. It can't be a bad thing that they slept because the wise and the foolish virgins both slept. So to me, it, it's not referring to a spiritual sleepiness. This is an actual sleepiness. But I want you to notice that Jesus gives an advance warning of the delay. He says, as the bridegroom was delayed, he is right here saying that his delay should be expected. Verse six through nine, but at midnight there was a cry, here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will be there will not be enough for us and for you. Go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. The wise woke ready and the foolish did not. Remember, they were all warned to be prepared. There's no excuse for not being prepared. They had been appointed to shine when the bridegroom came. They were told to give light when he came. Five of them did not take seriously their calling to give light and they neglected the only means by which they could do what they were called to do. They took no oil. Their job was to provide light and the foolish had lamps without oil, candles without wicks, torches without fire, light bulbs without electricity. Guys, they essentially had the outward form of religion and no internal power. They liked their position, but they didn't have the passion to use the necessary means to fulfill their position. Or maybe the power to light the lamp could simply be borrowed at the last minute, when in fact, it couldn't be borrowed at all. Notice the foolish tried to borrow oil from the wise and the wise didn't share. Were the wise selfish? No, they couldn't share. It was too late. Guys, if you fail to be diligent and about Jesus' work while he is gone, you can't all of a sudden make up for it on this day. But in desperation, these foolish bridesmaids, bridesmaids who wasted their lives ran for the impossible. They ran for end time obedience. They ran for instant end time faith. They took off for the drive through Verse 10, and while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. So what is this marriage feast? Well, I have to commit to believe that Jesus is referring to the marriage feast representing the end of age when Jesus comes back to take his bride, his church into heaven. 
Revelation 19, 6 through 10 speaks of this marriage supper that is to come. And according to this text, the bride has made herself ready and was dressed in fine linen, bright and pure. Guys, this, this fine linen that's bright and pure, it reflects holy and righteous living. That, that, that's what it resembles. So we want to ask ourselves now, are we people who pursue holiness? Next, we have to notice that the door is shut. Matthew 7, 21 and Luke 13, 24 through 30 speak of this same door. There's another reference to this door in the New Testament. It's referred to in a metaphorical sense. Acts 14, 27 says, And when they, Paul and Barnabas, arrived in Antioch and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. God had opened this door of faith to the Gentiles. Could it be that this door of faith was shut to the foolish virgins? I mean, it sounds as if it had been shut. And what this tells me is, is there, there's no second chances. There will be no end time faith available. Verses 11 through 12, afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I, I do not know you. These are the terrifying words at the end of age when Jesus comes back. I never knew you. Guys, I want y'all to understand the foolish virgins were part of the church. They, they had a lamp. They had religion. They had form. But they took no care for what was inside. They carried the lamp and they kept it shiny. Others looked at the foolish virgins and assumed they had life. They assumed they had faith and inner reality, but all they really had was an empty lamp. And now these foolish virgins are face to face with the one who sees right through their lamp. And he says to them, truly, I don't know you. Friends, no one wants to hear these words. So what do we do? Well, Jesus tells us in the very next verse, verse 13, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So what does it mean to be watchful? What does it mean to be ready for the bridegroom? Well, watch doesn't mean look out the window at night. It doesn't mean go up to the mountain and stare into the sky and wait for Jesus. It means be spiritually awake. It means be alive. It means be alert to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and that he gives us now. Use all the means God has given you to know him and love him and trust him. Be filled with the oil of the spirit that produces faith, joy, and hope. Be about his business while he is gone. Use the resources he's given you wisely. Be diligent. Know Jesus and make him known to the ends of the earth. Guys, what I've found is the key to, the, to Christian readiness is to constantly be kept filled with the Holy Spirit as, as Ephesians 5.18 tells us. Remember, Paul said, do not be drunk with wine. Be kept filled with the Holy Spirit. And we ask the question, well, how can we be kept filled? I didn't know I had to be kept filled. I thought I just received the Holy Spirit. No, you, we must be kept filled. Colossians 3.16 tells us how to be kept filled. Let the words of Christ dwell in us richly. Get into his word. Get your shovel out and go to work every day digging into the book called the Bible. Guys, the rake is not enough. It's not enough to be surface with God's word. Devour his word. Seek Christ, you find him. And when you find him, you know him. And when you know him, man, you fall in love with him. And when you fall in love with Jesus, obedience follows. Your obedience to Christ just is an overflow of your love for the Lord. It's not an obligation. It's, it's a pleasure 
It's a privilege. Guys, it was Spar uh, Charles Spurgeon who said, when that door is once shut, it will never be opened. There are some who dote and dream about an opening of that door after death for those who have died impenitent. But there is nothing in the scriptures to warrant such an expectation. Any larger hope than that revealed in the word of God is a delusion and a snare. Guys, in other words, when Jesus cracks the sky, it's a wrap. There is no more. In Matthew 24, Jesus told us the signs of the times and all about the end of the age. He told us what was coming. And he told us what his, coming would, his second coming would look like. He told us the wise ones will know the season. And he told us how he should find us when he comes. When he comes, the door will be shut and our opportunity will be no more. So the question we ask ourselves is how will he find us when he returns? Will he find us sleeping? Will he find us wasting our resources? Will he find us being lazy? Will he find us sitting on the sidelines? Friends, we cannot allow the Lord to find us like this. The time is now. Wake up, be diligent, be prepared, fill your lamps. Don't be caught unprepared. So what does this mean for us? Guys, it's not enough to be a member of a church. It's not enough to know doctrine and profess Jesus as Lord. It's not enough to be expectant of Jesus' return. The foolish virgins were members. The foolish virgins called Jesus Lord. The foolish virgins awaited his return. And what made the foolish foolish and the wise wise was what they possessed. The wise possessed the Holy Spirit and were led and empowered by him. Guys, the wise were found living faithful to King Jesus. So I urge you, as I urge myself to look within, check our hearts, check our motives. I urge you to take inventory of your lives. What do you find when you self-examine? How are you living? What is the fruit? Remember, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share what has been on my heart. To share this really rich parable, Lord, that tells us so much about you. Tells us so much about what's to come. Tells us so much about ourselves. It tells us so much about what we need to be doing. And Lord, I pray now that this message would not fall on deaf ears. I feel like it's nothing but deaf ears out in this world. No one wants truth. Lord, I know that you are working as much as I get frustrated and so badly just want to grab people by the shirt and just shake them. Lord, it's not my place. My place is to share this word and, and pray that your spirit will move in the hearts of whoever hears this. So Lord, I pray that you are glorified. I pray that you will be glorified. I pray that your name will be made known throughout this earth. Lord, thank you for allowing me to be your servant. I pray for every listener, every viewer, that they would be enriched. Lord, that they would leave this, this message and go do something. That they would check themselves. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, thank you for joining me on this episode of Straight Talk with Celine. I hope our time together has helped you take a small step towards living out the fullness of who you've been called to be. If this episode encouraged and edified you, please take a moment and think of that person that needs to hear this and do me a favor and share it. Jesus has called us to be ambassadors. Let us never forget that the mission is to know Jesus and to make him known. I love you all with the love of Christ. Until next time, take care.